Chapter 13. <clears throat> Once we settled into Block 28, the ache I'd felt since we arrived at Maznar subsided. It didn't entirely disappear, but it gradually submerged as a semblance of order returned and our pattern of life assumed a new design. For one thing, Keo and I and all the other children finally had a school. During the first year, teachers had volunteers, equipment had been, mass, make, had been makeshift, classes were scattered all over camp, in the mess hall, in recreation rooms, wherever we could squeeze it in. Now, a teaching staff had been hired. Two blocks were turned into Mazinar's High, and a third block of 15 barracks were set up and to house the elementary grades. We had blackboards, new decks, reference books, lab supplies. The second stable school year was one of the things our world commemorated when it came out in June of 1944. My days in classrooms are largely a blur now as one merged into another. What I see clearly is the face of my fourth grade teacher, a pleasant face, but completely invulnerable. It seemed to me at the time was sharp, commanding eyes. She came from Kentucky. She wore wedges, loose slaps and sweaters and were too short in the sleeves. A tall, heavy set spinster, about eh, 40 years old. She always wore a scarf on her head, tied beneath the chin, even during class. And she spoke with a slow, careful Appalachian accent. She was probably the best teacher I've ever had. Strict, fair-minded, dedicated to her job. Because of her, when we finally returned to outside world, I was academically at least more than prepared to keep up with my peers. I see her face, but what I hear still rings in my mind's ear. Is the glee club I belong to, made up of girls from fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. We rehearsed every day during the last period. In concert, we wore white cotton blouses and dark skirts. 40 voices strong, we were lined up at assemblies or at a talent show, in the fire breaks and singing in unison. All our favorite school kids used to learn Beautiful Dreamer, Down by the Old Mill Stream, Shine on Harvest Moon, and Battle Hymn of the Republic. Outside of school, we had a recreation program with leaders hired by the War Relocation Authority. During the weekday, they organized games and craft act activities. On weekends, we often took hikes beyond the fence. A series of picnic groups and campsites had been built by interns, clearly with tables, benches, and toilets. The first was about half a mile out, the furthest several miles into the Sierra. As restrictions gradually loosened, you could measure your liberty by how far they let you go. To camp three with a Caucasian, to camp three alone, to camp four with a Caucasian, to camp four alone. As fourth and fifth graders, we usually hiked out to camp one on the edge of the Bears Creek, where we could wade in rocks, wade, collect rocks, and sit on the bank eating lunches the mess hall crew had packed for us. I would always take along a quart jar with a white handkerchief and sit for an hour next to the stream, watching it strain through the cloth, trickling under the glass. Water there was the clearest I've ever seen, running right down off the snow. 
one of our leaders on these excursions was a pretty young woman named Lois, about 25 at the time, who wore long braids, a full skirt, and a peasant blouse. She was a Quaker. Like so many of the Caucasians who came in to teach and to do volunteer work. She also had a crush on a tall, very handsome and popular Nicene boy who sometimes sang and danced in the talent show. His name was Isa. In order to find a little free time together, Lois and Isa arranged an overnight camping trip for all the girls in our class. We took jars for water, potatoes to roast, and an army blanket and hiked up Bears Creek one Friday afternoon to a nice little knoll at base of the mountain. All the girls were tearing and giggling at the way Isa and Lois held hands and looked at each other. They built us a big driftwood fire that night and told us ghost stories until they figured we had all dozed off. Then they disappeared for a while into the sage bush. I was still awake and heard their careful footsteps snapping twigs. I thought how hard it would be to walk around out there without a flashlight. It was years later that I remembered and I understood what that outing must have been for them. At that time, I had my own escape to keep me occupied. In truth, I barely noticed the, the departure. This was the first overnight camping trip I'd ever made. For me, it was enough to be outside the barracks for a night. Outside the square mile of wire, next to a crackling blaze and looking at stars so thick and so close to the ground, I could have reached up and scooped out an armful. If I had been told the next morning that I could stay outside the fences as long as I wanted, that I was free to go, it would have sent me sprinting for the compound. Lovely as they were to look at, the Sierras were frightening to think about an icy barricade. If you took off in the opposite direction and made it past the Inus, you'd hit Death Valley. While to the south, there was a loom of ranging of brown sculpted hills everywhere. Everyone said they were full of rattlesnakes. Camp One was about as far as I cared to venture. What's more, Block 28, where I lived now. One night was plenty, one night every once in a while to explore whatever was out there. You might call that the image for a whole series of little explorations. I began to make during the next year, looking for some place outside, early groping for that special thing I could do or to be by myself. In addition to the regular school sessions and the recreation program, classes of every kind were being offered all over camp. Singing, acting, trumpet playing, tap dancing, plus traditional Japanese arts like needlework, judo, and keto. The first class I attended was in baton twirling, taught by a chubby girl about 14 named Nancy. In the beginning, I used to swayed off broomsticks with old tennis ball stuck on one end. When it looked like I was getting to keep at this, mama ordered me one like Nancy from Sears and Robux catalog. Nancy was a very good twirler and taught us younger kids all her tricks. For months I practiced, joined the baton club at school and even entered contests. Since then, I have often wondered what drew me to it at that age. I wonder because of all the activities I tried out in camp, that was the one I stayed with. In fact, returning to almost obsessively 
when I entered high school in Southern California a few years later. By that time, I was desperate to be accepted and baton twirling was one trick I could perform that was truly, unmistakably American. Putting on my boots and a dress crisscrossed with braids, spinning the silver stick and tossing it high in the tune of John Philip Sousa March. Even at 10, before I really knew what I wanted outside, the Japanese in me could not compete with it. I tried in camp and many times later in one form or another. My visit to the old geisha who lived across the fire break was a typical example of how those attempts turned out. She was offering lessons in traditional dance called order. A lot of young girls studied this in order to take part in the big Odan festival held every August, a festival honoring dead ancestors, asking them to bring good crops in the fall. She was about 70, a tiny aristocratic looking woman. She took students in the barricade cubicle, which was fitted out like a little Buddhist shrine with tamarind mats, tatamaya mats on the floor. She would kneel in her kimono and speak very softly in Japanese while her young assistant would gracefully swing closed knees or bend her swan-like neck to the old geisha instruction. I sat across from the room for her for an hour trying to follow what was going on. It was all a mystery. I had never learned the language and this woman was so old, even her dialect was foreign to me. She seemed an occult figure, more spirit than human. When she bowed to me from the knees at the end of the hour, I rushed out of there, back to my more familiar surroundings. Sometimes about her fascinated me. For a while, I tried to keep in contact with her lore via the reports of two girls from class, Rico and Matusi, who had stayed on as students. Because they came from wealthy families and spoke and understood both English and Japanese, they had high opinions of themselves. Whenever I pressed them for details of what they learned, they would tease me. A good dancer must have good skin, Ryoko would say. In order to have good skin, you must rub rose brilletti hair tonics on your face and rub cold cream in your hair. I went home and did this secretly when no one else was around and waited for my skin to become the skin of an odor dancer. You have to think about your clothing, Miss Situ would say tell me. A good dancer is recognized by her clothing. You should wear your stockings inside out and never, never wear any underpants. I did this too on the sly until mama asked me why my socks were always inside out and why I was wearing nothing underneath my dress. She was not amused when I explained it to her. She told me to stay away from those girls. They were just being mean. And if I wanted lessons from the old geisha woman, mama herself would take me over there and arrange it. I shook my head and told her no. I didn't want to do that right now. I had another kind of dance in mind. This time it was ballet. I'd never seen ballet. I'd only heard of it, but it sounded like something I would want to do. In Ocean Park, I had taken tap dance lessons my older brothers would coax me to perform for visitors, and it gained me a lot of attention. In camp, I had already danced in a couple of talent shows. When the word came around that a woman was offering ballet lessons, I showed up with three other young girls. It was a dusty day anyhow, and there wasn't much you could do outside. The class was an abandoned 
barracks. No one had lived there for months. Light showed through the warped planks. It was almost like going back two years to the day we first arrived, except that a piano sat in the bare splendored, splintered boards. And here was a 30-ish Japanese woman with her hair pulled back into a Chicano wearing a pink tutu, a pair of pink toed dance shoes and no tights. At the piano sat a young girl with glasses on studying some sheet music in the not quiet adequate light from a single overhead bulb. When we were all in the room and seated on the floor, she began to play and the dancers began to dance as if they were the ones trying out, not us. She twirled and leaped from wall to wall, flinging her arms. She had been a good dancer once, but now she was overweight and sat and sad to watch, even in the eyes of a 10 year old who had never seen this kind of dance. I was intrigued by her strange foot toe shoes, badly frayed and worn down by the boards. I stared too at her legs. I could not stop watching them while she spun, sidestepping, not toes. They were thick, white, blue vein, tapered sharply from the quivering thigh. And the kind of legs my older sisters would have called abandi gitosh. Dadkin means horse dish and adish means leg. She began to show us a few steps and tricks, beginning with the splits. She hoisted herself and reversed her tor torso and came down again with her legs spread. I winced, sure the planks would tear her skin. Then she got the four of us up to the first position, which I did mainly out of courtesy in order not to hurt the feelings of the heavy woman with her Darkin Ashley and her shredded shoes. After showing us the first three ballet positions, she sat down to rest. She took her shoes off. Her toes were showing blood. I noticed then the lines on her face and traces of gray in her black hair. I felt so sorry for her. I decided to go ahead and sign up for her course. But once I left that room back out into the dusty wind flooring afternoons, I never did return to ballet. Ballet seemed then some terrible misuse of the, bo of the body. And she was so anxious to please us, her very need to hold on to whatever she had been scared me away. Among my exploration during these months, there was one more final venture into catechism. The Mary Knoll Chapel was just up the street now and easy to get to. I resumed my catechism. Once again, I was listening with rapt terror to the lies of the saints and the martyrs, although there wasn't really what attracted me this time. I found another kind of inspiration, had seen another way the church might make me into something quite extraordinary. I had watched a girl my own age shining at the center of one of the elaborate ceremonies. It appeared to me tremendously. She happened to be an orphan. And I figured that if this much could befell an orphan, imagine how impressive I would look in such a role. I had long observed her from a distance, a slim and lonely girl and always a loaf because of the way other kids treated orphans there, as if a lack of parents put you somehow beneath everyone else. I confess, I felt that way myself. Orphans were in a class apart. In block 28, we saw them often, Children's Village, where Sister Susan 
and sister Bernadette put in a good deal of time was as near to us as their chapel, two blocks away in the opposite direction. Each day, about a dozen of them, including this girl, would come trooping past our barracks on the way to catechism class. On days I intended to go, I would wait till they were half a block ahead so I wouldn't be seen arriving in their midst. This girl had already been baptized. What I witnessed was her confirmation. She was dressed like a bride in a white gown, white lace hood and sheer veil. Walking towards the altar down the aisle of the converted barracks, watching her from the pews, I was pierced with envy for the position she had gained. At the time, I was filled with the awe and with startled wonder at the notion that this girl, this orphan, could become such a queen. A few days later, I let it be known that I was going to be baptized into the church and confirmed as soon as the nuns thought I was ready. I announced this to the sisters and they rejoiced. I announced it at home and Papa exploded. No, he roared, absolutely not. I just stood there, stunned, too scared to speak. You're too young. I started to cry. How are you going to get married? He shouted. If you got baptized a Catholic, you have to marry a Catholic. No Japanese boys are in the Catholic church. You get baptized now, how are you going to find a good Japanese boy to marry? I ran to mama, but she knew better than to argue with him about this. I ran to the chapel and told Sister Bernadette, and she came hurrying to the barracks. She and Papa had become pretty good friends over the months. Once every week or so, she would visit, and while she sipped her apricot brandy, they would talk about religion. But this time, when she came to the door and called, What's he, sons? He met her out there shouting, No, no baptism. She raised her eyebrows, trying to stare at him. He rose to his full height, as if she, about the size of Mama, was the general of some invading army and said, too young, old enough to know God. Who knows anything of God at 10? This made her angry. At any other time, they would have taken an hour hearing each other out. But now when she opened her mouth to reply, he upheld flat palm, stopped her. He was not going to argue. He wouldn't even let her pass the door. In exasperation, she glared at him, then turned and walked away. I ran to my bunk, devastated and wept, hating him. I was too ashamed to go back to catechism after that. I just hated Papa for weeks and dreamed of the white gown princess I might have become. Late afternoon, practicing my baton on the fire break, angrily, I would throw him into the air and watch him twirl and catch him and throw him high again and again and again.